adab salam and a very good morning to all of you i welcome all of you to this inaugural session may i kindly request the honorable vice chancellor sahab to come on the dais along with other guests with the permission of the chair we shall start the program with the manu tarana may i request the members of the engineering staff to play please play the manu tarana शहर इल्म है उर्दू जबान का सफ 
पर यहाँ से करे आसमान का शहर इल्म है उर्दू जबान का रिस्पेक्टेड चेयर प्रोफेसर सैयद अनुल हसन साहब ऑनरेबल वाइस चांसलर मौलाना आजाद नेशनल उर्दू यूनिवर्सिटी जनरल प्रेसिडेंट ऑफ द तेलंगाना हिस्ट्री कांग्रेस 2024 प्रोफेसर राधिका सेशन फॉर्मर प्रोफेसर ऑफ हिस्ट्री सावित्री बाई फूले पुणे यूनिवर्सिटी गेस्ट ऑफ ऑनर प्रोफेसर एस एम अजीजुद्दीन हुसैन साहब ऑनरेरी प्रोफेसर सी यू सी एस मानू प्रोफेसर के अर्जुन राव सर प्रेसिडेंट तेलंगाना हिस्ट्री कांग्रेस जनरल सेक्रेटरी ऑफ द तेलंगाना हिस्ट्री कांग्रेस एम वीरेंद्र जी लोकल हिस्ट्री ऑफ द तेलंगाना लोकल सेक्रेटरी ऑफ द तेलंगाना हिस्ट्री कांग्रेस प्रोफेसर दानिश मोइन हेड डिपार्टमेंट ऑफ हिस्ट्री मौलाना आजाद नेशनल उर्दू यूनिवर्सिटी गेस्ट्स स्कॉलर्स स्टूडेंट्स एंड लेडीज एंड जेंटलमैन इट गिव्स मी इमेंस प्लेजर टू वेलकम यू ऑल टू दिस इनागरल प्रोग्राम ऑफ द तेलंगाना हिस्ट्री कांग्रेस सेवन्थ तेलंगाना हिस्ट्री कांग्रेस विच इज़ बींग ऑर्गेनाइज बाय द डिपार्टमेंट ऑफ हिस्ट्री मौलाना आजाद नेशनल उर्दू यूनिवर्सिटी एंड आई एम पर्टिकुलरली ग्रेटफुल टू ऑल दी स्कॉलर्स and history enthusiasts who have come from different parts of the country to take part in this congress and to share their ideas and research and new findings on the history of the telangana region which is exactly the purpose of the telangana history congress and i'm also elated because of the simple reason that our department and our university was chosen to host this year's telangana history congress not because we have a good infrastructure of course we do and that is undeniably true but because for us the congress opens up the possibility for faculty members scholars students to interact and learn with a wider range of scholarship that is taking place in the domain of history and knowledge and most particularly in the history of the telangana region um uh, and i i think that uh, this congress this year is one among many big achievements and accomplishment that our university has been able to achieve successfully in the last couple of years under the dynamic leadership of the honorable vice chancellor sir without a further ado let me straight away invite the local secretary professor danish moeen head department of history to formally welcome the gathering professor danish moeen head department of history Uh, thank you ekram with your permission chair respected vice chancellor sahab professor sayed anul hasan professor radhika sheshan general president seventh session of telangana history congress uh, professor azizuddin sahab eminent historian guest of honor of this program professor arjun rao garu uh, president telangana history congress and shri एम वीरेंदर गारू जनरल सेक्रेटरी तेलंगाना हिस्ट्री कांग्रेस एंड इक्वली रिस्पेक्टेड ऑडियंस सिटिंग इन दक्वली रिस्पेक्टेड गेस्ट सिटिंग इन द ऑडियंस आई मस्ट नेम सम ऑफ दम सम ऑफ द इम्पॉर्टेंट नेम इज हेयर ऑफकोर्स द सेक्शनल प्रेजिडेंट सिटिंग इन द इन इन फ्रंट ऑफ अस प्रोफेसर सुचिंद्रा घोष शी इज गोइंग टू हेड द चेयर द सेशन ऑफ एंशन हिस्ट्री ancient telangana history and professor uh, and dr sanjay gar who is going to do uh, 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 sanjay gar the president for the medieval section and then we have uh, uh, professor sai uh, professor nath who is also going to do the the, the modern section and sai kesho for contemporary history and above all one of the important persons such as shahid is also here he is going to deliver a special lecture in the evening session so, and apart from that the most respected faculty of the depart different department of the fac different department dean dean head director who are sitting here i am i on behalf of the department of 
hastily welcome you all. You know, uh, first of all, I would like to thanks to the Telangana History Congress Executive Committee member who has shown faith in me to organize this this conference here in Manu. But it became possible not because of me. It became possible because the most uh, important person in this field that was academy, academically oriented vice chancellor of the UST, who has given me the permission to hold, not only the permission to hold, but financial as well as infrastructure support for that. So I must thanks to, uh, to Professor Anul Hassan sir for, for his kind gesture. My thanks due to my, uh, all my uh, uh, registrar, because registrar was also instrumental for this function, Professor Ishtiaq Ahmed. I am missing one important person here in this, in this uh, gathering, uh, our Dean Professor, uh, Professor Faida Siddiqui, because of her illness, she is not available, but she was always an instrument for, for me, for the Department of History. She was a big support for the Department of History. And I uh, also, on behalf, and, and in her sense, I also I, um, thanks her and for his uh, support. Uh, it, apart from that, I, I must say an important thing that uh, this, this Telangana History Congress became possible because of the mo most important factor in this is my own faculty, faculty department of history. They are the backbone of this, this, this function. I can name all, all not one. Or if may, I can just start from the, the organizing secretary, Mr. Uh, Dr. Ekramul Haq, and then my colleague Rafiullah Azmi, Khalid, and Parve, Daud. They are the backbone of this function. And apart from the uh, scholar from the, the faculty from different departments, particularly maybe mentioned the DD uh, history department, particularly Mahbub Basha and his team was very much there. Subhash was also there with us. So all of them who was involved with this, in, I, uh, from my bottom of all, I thanks and welcome you all in this. You know, uh, I would like to say why Indian history, the Congress History Congress has started. What for the purpose of Indian History Congress? Though History Congress has a long history, we can go back to 1935 when Indian History Congress was established. And Indian History Congress was established just for one establishment, the academic standard to improve the academic standard, a spirit of national unity, and objective interpretation of history free from the sectional bias. That was the base. Based on this tradition, Almost every state started forming their own in this history congress. So that was uh, either it is UP History Congress, Kerala History Congress, and then some region started also having one section. Then we have South Indian History Congress, Andhra Pradesh History Congress. All history congresses, all the states started appearing, forming this, this type of thing. Telangana history is Telangana is also a new state, but it also formed his, its own history congress. And this history congress, again, the purpose of that, that we have to give the, an objective history. We have to write the objective history. That was the main thing. And our interpretation should be based on the evidences available on that. We are not working on the myth. We are mainly working on the history. We should have to have full distinction between myth and the history. And this type of forum is prepared for that that we can train the young student, young scholar, how to write history, how the history should be interpreted. That was the basic purpose. It's not only in, in, in Telangana, but almost every state in the country is doing in this way. So our aim is to produce an, an objective history. And that was the reason we have been doing. Then we also have to do one thing. This is, a, I must tell you one thing, that the Department of History is a very new department. It was established only nine years back. And today we are in position to hold this program. And apart from that, we have conducted two, three uh, 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 refresher courses and all that we have. So far, five PhD has been published from the Department of ST. And we are involved in one of the important activity. All the research activity, apart from the research activity, student has been given the full training to prepare for the UPSC and other, apart from the research. Research has also given the most important. And we have been teaching in, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a scientific manner, the rational way history should be studied in a rational way. And that is the main uh, crux. Introducing the student with a different faculty 
faculties of different departments, different universities. Regularly, scholars are coming from the different departments. One of the important backbone of the department is presently by because of our uh, honorable vice chancellor, Professor Deepak Kumar is with us, that he is honorary professor, and his kind uh, gesture, his kind uh, uh, encouragement to the faculty as well as the student is, a, is, a, is, a, is a one of the important assets of the department. And then uh, finally, uh, in order to understand history of a particular period, what we have done, we have entire history of Telangana has been divided into roughly 15 sections. And all 15 sections is we are not confined to one particular region, one section that a student can contribute. Ancient, medieval, modern, that was the general style. Apart from that, we also given the women in Telangana. We have epigraphic and numismatic is generally not been covered. We have covered in this also. We have uh, uh, education system in Telangana, Telangana movement, pre and post independent art and architecture, and all etc. These are the these are the topic which students and the scholar are contributing the peer. With this, and I, I must thanks to, I must welcome all of you, including my student, teachers, and uh, technical staff. Uh, I welcome you all. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, before we continue with our program, we would like to honor our guests and speakers by presenting them uh, a small token of appreciation shawl and a sapling. Um, first and foremost, um, I would request the Honorable Vice Chancellor Professor Sayyid Anul Hassan Sahab to honor the General President of the Telangana History Congress, Professor Radhika Seshan. I would request the volunteers to please bring the shawl and a sapling. Please bring. The General Secretary of the Telangana History Congress, M. Virender Ji, will honor uh, the Honorable Vice Chancellor, Professor Sayyid Anul Hassan Sahab. Professor Danish Moeen will honor Professor Arjun Rao, the President of the Telangana History Congress. Uh, the local secretary, Mr. Uh, Virender Ji will present a shawl and a bouquet to the guest of honor, Professor S.M. Azizuddin Hussain Saab. M. Virender Ji is also requested to present a shawl and a sapling to the local secretary, Professor Danish Moeen, Head Department of History. We also have with us uh, the sectional presidents of the four respective sessions. Um, I would also request them to please come on the dais. And uh, 
and I would request the Professor uh, Sayyid Anul Hassan Sahab, the Honorable Vice Chancellor, sir, to uh, kindly honor Professor Suchandra Ghosh with a shawl and a sapling, who is the chair of the ancient Telangana history session. May I now request Dr. Sanjay Garg, Deputy Director, National Archives of India, who is the Chair of the Medieval Telangana History Section. Yeah. May I kindly request the Honorable Vice Chancellor, sir, to honor Professor S. Siri Nath, who is the chair of the modern Telangana history session. May I kindly request Dr. Sai Bhakta Keshava, who is the president of the local history section. Yeah, he's here. He's here, he's here. Oh, sorry, sir. Thank you, sir. And a very important person of this program, the General Secretary, uh, Mr. Virender Ji, will be presented with a shawl and a bouquet by the Honorable Vice Chancellor. Sir. Thank you, sir, for doing the honor. Well, you may wonder what is the history of the Telangana History Congress and how it was conceptualized and how over the years, despite so many problems and obstacles, the Telangana History Congress has been working both on and off the field. To show some light on some of these questions and points, may I now invite the General Secretary of the Telangana History Congress, M. Virender Ji, to tell us a little more about the Telangana History Congress. M. Virender Ji. Uh, good morning, respected Vice Chancellor Sahib, Professor Anil Hassanji, Telangana History Congress President Professor Arjun Rauji, Ajka Chief Guest, uh, Guest of Honor Aziz Hussain Sahib, Professor Azizuddin Sahib, and uh, General President Professor Radhika Sheshanji, and Local Secretary Professor Danish Ji, and uh, all sectional presidents, Suchindra Ghoshji, Sanjay Garji, Srinathji, and Sai Bhakta Keshav, and special lecture invitee Sajjadji, and other guests. I'm very happy to be here in Manu for this seventh annual Congress of Telangana History Congress. Yes, uh, this was, uh, Congress was formed in 2007, but you can ask me why, how it is uh, seventh one. 
because of various reasons after first conference due to some telangana movement agitation at etc or some some other problems we could not continue the annual conferences up to 2019 again we revived this in 2019 again there was a hitch because of the covid one year we could not do it so that is why they they has come to this is only seventh one and sixth we have completed at uh, telangana university and this seventh is the manu i am very much grateful to the vice chancellor sir because when we met in the first meeting he readily agreed said yes we are going to have it thank you so much sir on behalf of entire telangana history congress members then we spoke to danish ji is a good friend of mine and he also said yes virender ji we are going to have this so the date also given by the vice chancellor sir it's himself and this is fixed we are here on this day and the speciality of this is a usually we are publishing articles in telangana history congress annual proceedings english and telugu from this year onwards we are accepting the papers in urdu also <laughs> as requested and approved by the apna general body and danish ji i think so far we have uh, 34 35 till yesterday we have received abstracts from the scholars and the faculty members usme se kam se kam 10 12 urdu mein hai it's a very good uh, innovative and uh, we hope in future also because some may think that this is being organized at manu that's why urdu papers are coming but i i don't think in future also we may receive the same urdu papers also for future congresses also that i require also i wish also sir then i must say one thing because of selecting this university is i should say because it's a fact at present no university is having full fledged faculty members you take usmania archaeology department kagate kagate or any any university but this manu is having the full fledged department with 10 history lecturers so we should appreciate the uh, vc sir for having all this faculty good faculty members because then when faculty is there only then only students will come and department will develop i hope this will take uh, taken by the government if koi kal paper mein aaye to bhi so they have to give the permission to recruit the people in the uh, lecturers in the departments also that we on behalf of as general secretary of telangana history congress i request the government telangana government to recruit the people the lecturers in the all the departments which have are vacant for the last so many years more than 10 to 15 years this is my request to the telangana government so i don't take much time i on behalf of telangana history congress i welcome you all and thank you all all the research scholars paper presenters and uh, sectional presidents everybody whoever are here goel sir bhi aaye hain thank you very much sir so thank you everybody for coming over here and uh, thank you so much uh thank you very much sir uh, may i now invite our guest of honor professor s m azizuddin hussain sahab for a few words um you might be already uh, knowing professor azizuddin hussain sahab who is an accomplished scholar and historian and very well known for his works um on the history of islam and sufism in south asia last year only he published an encyclopedic work on the sufis of deccan uh, with all due respect professor s m azizuddin hussain sir maazi ka ehtiram zaruri hai aaj bhi ye aur baat hai ke zamana badal gaya professor sayed anul hasan sahab वाइस चांसलर मौलाना आज़ाद नेशनल उर्दू यूनिवर्सिटी प्रोफेसर राधिका शेषन प्रोफेसर वीरेंद्र जनरल सेक्रेटरी तेलंगाना हिस्ट्री कांग्रेस प्रोफेसर दानिश मुहिन लोकल लोकल सेक्रेटरी हिस्ट्री कांग्रेस प्रोफेसर अर्जुन राय 
friends and dear students i am highly grateful for this honor to professor danish moin and his colleagues for giving me an opportunity to speak today i remember that is the tumash the sultan of delhi had appointed a warden of his sons to look after his the teaching of his sons so when the warden reported that now the language and grammar is completed so his tumash asked him that he has you give them the rewards and now you appoint eminent historians to teach my sons and i have procured two recent publications from baghdad masur saratin and adab saratin to teach my sons so in 13th century a sultan of delhi was so conscious that his sons should know history but unfortunately in 2001 the former chief minister of andhra pradesh dropped history from 11th and 12th class so just see the contrast the importance of history in 13th century and the importance of history uh, in the 21st century uh, by the chief minister of andhra pradesh some teachers opposed it among those dr mehboob basha was one of those who opposed this decision of the andhra pradesh government there are certain problems in the history and even today we are facing this problem in delhi in north india in south also we are teaching that mohammed bin tolak transferred the capital from delhi to dolatabad he never transferred the capital it is totally a wrong notion which we are passing to our students basically he has selected ulama and mashayikh to go to dolatabad because from the period of alauddin khilji uh, dolatabad was only a cantonment and there was no exchange of ideas with the local people and it could only be done when the mashayikh will go and they will establish their co contact with the local people so mohammed bin tughlaq do you say that mohammed bin tughlaq failed i think mohammed bin tughlaq became successful and the maulana azad uh, national urdu university is basically the result of the uh, dream which mohammed bin tughlaq saw in tughlaqabad during 14th century so these were the ideas of these sultans but we misinterpret uh, to our students in our classrooms not only here but even in delhi university in the leading even in jamia ali ghar we always teach that mohammed bin tughlaq transfer the capital from delhi to dolatabad uh with the coming of the muslims the school of historiography was also developed and we find in delhi and other towns historians wrote history wrote histories like tabqat e nasri and jawdin बर्नी इस तारीख फिर रोशाई एन अबुल फल अकबर नामा एन आइन अकबर या नजर वर्कस ऑल्सो विद दस्टेब्लिशमेंट ऑफ बेहमनी सल्तनत एन दी गोलकुंडा एन बीजापुर दे ऑल्सो पेट्रोनाइज द राइटिंग ऑफ हिस्ट्री इन साउथ और इन डकन बट वेन आई एग्जामिन अराउंड थर्टी फाइव हिस्ट्रीज विच वर रिटर्न इन डेली सो देर इज नो कंपेरिजन between the histories written in, in delhi or in agra in comparison to tarikh e firoshai or abul fazl 
اکبر نامہ اور آئین اکبری اور منتخب تواریخ آف دا بدائیون سو وی فائنڈ دیٹ ایز فار ایز دی ہسٹوروگرافی وچ ڈیولپ ان ڈیکن سو وی ڈو ناٹ فائنڈ اینی اینالیسس آف دی فیکٹس اینڈ دے ہیو جسٹ ڈاکومینٹیڈ دی ڈیٹا دی ڈیٹیلس آف دی وارس اینڈ ادر ڈیٹیلس ان دیز ہسٹریز دی اینالیسس وی فائنڈ ان جیادین برنیز تاریخ فروشائی سو وی ڈو ناٹ فائنڈ سیم اینالیسس ان دا ہسٹریز ریٹن ڈورنگ میڈیول پیریڈ ان دا ریجن آف ڈیکن سیم سچویشن وی فائنڈ وین دا میڈیول ہسٹری رائٹنگ اسٹارٹیڈ اینڈ آئی تھنک دی فرسٹ اینڈ فور موسٹ اسکول واز ایٹ الہ آباد دین اٹ شفٹیڈ ٹو علی گڑھ اینڈ علی گڑھ از ہسٹورین پلیڈ این امپارٹنٹ رول ان رائٹنگ دی نیو ہسٹری آف میڈیول انڈیا اینڈ وی فائنڈ دا لیڈنگ رول واز پلیڈ بائی پروفیسر محمد حبیب نور الحسن کے نظامی اظہر عباس اینڈ پروفیسر عرفان حبیب این ادر سچ ٹائپ آف ٹیم ٹیم آئی ڈونٹ سی ان ڈیکن دیٹ دا ہسٹورینس ہو ہیو ریٹن انکلوڈنگ ہارون خان شیروانی ہو بلانگ ٹو علی گڑھ بیکاز ہز ہوم ٹاؤن از نیئر علی گڑھ سو دی علی گڑھ اسکول آف ہسٹورینس دے ہیو کورڈ آل آسپیکٹس آف ہسٹری فار ایگزامپل پروفیسر نور الحسن In 1948, he submitted his PhD thesis in Oxford University on Chishti and Sorvardi Silsila. So they were writing on, on the Sufis also and their contribution. But as far as the writings of uh, the historians of Deccan is concerned, we do not find any mention, any contribution of the Sufis. Same is for Maharashtra also, Professor uh, Radhika. That Sufis are forgotten in Deccan and whole south. They don't mention the contribution of the Sufis and they contributed a lot, the Deccani and how uh, they wrote books in Deccani and how they transmitted the Sufi ideas to the people of Deccan. So this aspect is totally missing. That is why I thought I wrote uh, uh, this book, Sufis of Deccan, and we find only Eaton has written Sufis of Bijapur and no person or no historian from Deccan reviewed his book, whatever he said, we have accepted. So these are some uh, problems with the history writings in Deccan. And on the other hand, we find that, uh, for example, uh, because we are not uh, consulting the Sufi sources, uh, I have read in one of the uh, Taskras that uh, Shivaji's grandfather was not having any children. So he went to Shah Sharif that you pray for my children. So two sons were born. So he named Shivaji and Shahji. Today Maharashtra drives his identity with Shivaji, but Shivaji drived identity with Shah Sharif. So because we are not teaching, teaching the role and contribution of the Sufis in this region, so this aspect is totally neglected. I think Uh, the same idea was there of Maulana Azad Library, uh, Maulana Azad, because I sit in Maulana Azad Library for, uh, for a greater time. So Maulana Azad National University and University Grant Commission, they have established Harun Khan Sherwani Center for Deccan Studies that on new lines, on new sources. For example, there are 14 lakh documents preserved in Telangana archives. They are lying, no calendaring has taken place of these documents. Professor Yusuf Hussain Khan, when he was in Uswaniya University, he only edited 200 documents only. 14 lakh documents are lying, waiting the attention of the historians of the Deccan so that uh, history could be written, written on, on the basis of documents. Same situation is of the historiography. Uh, the British historians, uh, translated by establishing Royal Asiatic Society of ben Bengal and major histories were translated in English. But here we do not find the English translations of these sources. So naturally, now the students and the researchers uh, are not having the knowledge of uh, sources. So their, uh, their areas were also restricted. They can't consult Persian documents and the Persian histories So I think 
Telangana History Congress, like Indian History Congress, should also resolve, as they have resolved, for the writing of comprehensive history of, of India. So, comprehensive history of Deccan should be written by the historians of Telangana as well as Andhra Pradesh, so that the, on the basis of uh, the research material, new history could be written. I am highly grateful uh, to Professor Danish Mohin and his colleagues. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. We very well understand uh, your concern and anxiety that not many scholars are working on the history of Deccan. But let's agree on at least one thing, that maybe this Congress this year is perhaps an auspicious beginning of the year 2024 with the hope that most of us will continue to work on areas neglected so far. The journey has just begun. Thank you. Uh, may I very humbly request uh, Professor K. Arjun Rao, our guest of honor, to say a few words. Professor K. Arjun Rao, he is the President of the Telangana History Congress and Dean, Faculty of Social Sciences, Usmania University. Honorable Vice Chancellor, Syed Asanji, today's inaugural function, Telangana History Congress, General President Radhika Sheshanji, and uh, recently our introduction started at uh, Vaisag in APST Congress. Asanji, who is uh, look after for the local history of uh, historiography of uh, the APST Congress in Vaisag, and uh, local secretary Dhanuji, and my dear colleague, General Secretary Dr. Virendraji. main body of the Telangana History Congress and the EC members of the Telangana History Congress, delegates, different delegates from the different universities in Telangana, Kakataya, Mahatma Gandhi University, and Telangana University, and other degree college faculty, jails, scholars, students, and last, not least, it is uh, history lovers of Telangana. And uh, senior academicians like uh, Goyalji, my guru, Professor Krishan Rao Garu, and Rekha Panemam, Sanjadji, my mentor, Professor Srinath Garu from Kakut University, and the non teaching staff from the Manu University to directly, indirectly help to the conducting of the seventh session of Telangana History Congress today in Manu Princess. So, first of all, I want to explain two things. The two capacities. One is the guest of honor. The second one is the president of Telangana History Congress. That is my responsibility. Why the Telangana History Congress was started? What is the vision? What is the motto? So, there are so many history congresses in the world, right? North America, South America, World History, Asian History Congress, Asian Association History Congress, Indian History Congress, Southern History Congress, AP History Congress, all the things. But here, what we found in Telangana region area, there is a gap, a lot of gap in the research part. How we fill the, that gap? Our elders, like Professor Vaikundam Garu, Kishan Rao Garu, and their advice, the Telangana History Congress started 2007, almost all, uh, to, to the 24, means 16, 17 years over. Of course, what are the obstacles for conducting pre periodically, every annually, our general secretary was explained, due to the reason, some reasons, no issue, it is a fact. But hereafter, we want to make a strength in Telangana History Congress. How? with necessity. Part of that, we involved, invite to all the degree college faculty, jails, history lovers, 
to develop the to fill the gap in telangana area part of that we are run in 2024 onwards to strengthen the telangana state congress of course we encourage young scholars too that is more important so part of that welcome sir this is one one word i am saying you don't have to be a great to start something but you have to start something to be a great part of that since four five years a team a research scholars under my guidance my supervision to working on who is the founder of the architect of the usman university i call up the arts college of course um, sajaji knows name no but what the his figure photograph so far none of the scholar none of the historian to identify his photograph who is the architect of arts college so recently we came to know that the research development so the architect of the arts college building is monsieur ernest josfer his photo remained undiscovered for 90 years until 2024 as on date where one of the my scholar scholars he found he found his photography in uh, fans paris in library in fair um, french so primary sources evidence and the primary the primary sources were available to the confirm the identity and photography of his belgium architect so for the writing of the history for the rebuilt of history for the reconstruction of history a local history that is more important for the primary source of course our brothers writers also can write history but that is also accept history but who are the writing history based on the primary sources that is more an accurate appropriate history as the academicians we should agree accept and prove for the history of telangana part of that the great architect minister ernest josfer's another creation was the building of holy spies in cairo capital of the egypt city who is now staying present of the egypt a building which is architected by the uh, josfer so it is uh, of course based on the, that construction our seventh nizam was invited josfer to construct the building of the arts college of course in the cairo egypt building was there are two culture indication what is one is muslim and uh, uh, christian but whereas our art usman ishi arts college was it is indicated that three cultures reflecting one is hindu one is muslim one is christianity so jasper was adding the hindu culture for the arts college building so in this way it is a striking resemblance of the arts college building is usmania university he was the architect of the holpius building which is currently a present place by the president of the egypt in cairo his remarks was in cairo gained the attention of seventh nizam mir usman ali khan and was hired to draw a plans for the usman university 1933 so his photograph was now been discovered in france with our efforts our scholars my scholars efforts it is currently in the archives of the bnf library paris in france so this type of gaps this type of research should be developed part of that the vision of the telangana state congress was started for the to fill this gaps that is the telangana state has a vision so now it was already we across that we researched so many things in the local part i appreciate siddipeta uh, degree and pg college they initiative for that conducting local history to importance of local history you know that the culture of ministry of culture of central india central government was giving a project which is a, 
uh, to give priority for the local sri local people uh, to hidden state to bring out for the future generations part of that is the deepak ji who is the principal investigator of the bombay iit he was a taken grand project that one he has across the country was moving and uh, encouraging for the young scholars to conduct and give the information for the local history and local personalities to give the uh, future generations that is more important there is more initiative for the central government also to praise and uh, pride of the telangana central government of india so part of that i congratulate city pet degree college and pg college to initiative for starting the priority for conducting a national seminar for the local history so uh, thanks for uh, your listening of course it is a, uh, as a president of telangana history it is my responsibility to inform what is our vision our path so thank you for uh, once again thanks for honorable vice chancellor ji to on uh, giving 7th uh, host the 7th congress of telangana city congress thank you one and all thank you sir uh, my apologies we are actually running short of time and our honorable vice chancellor has other commitments now is the time for presidential address but before i request the general president to do the honor let me very briefly introduce her work to some of you who might not be familiar with the kind of work that she has done Professor Radhika Seshan retired as professor and head department of history Savitri Bai Phule Pune University in 2019 and is now visiting faculty at the Symbiosis School for Liberal Arts Pune. She specializes in medieval Indian history uh, with special focus on trade particularly textiles and on the mercantile networks across the Indian Ocean littoral. Um she has uh i think pretty long teaching career over three decades during which she has trained professionals and scholars alike and produced enormous historical works and published articles in journals in both national and international um apart from many other scholarly works she has a very popular book that is very popular among scholars and particularly students of the universities uh the name is the ideas and institutions in medieval india this is a book that was very popular among us when we were undergraduate students and we all grew up reading that book very recently she published uh, i would just name a few the constructions of the east in western travel narratives 1300 1800 which was published in 2020 by rutledge wage earners in india 1500 to 1900 regional approaches in an international context which she jointly published with john lucasen um most recently i think that she has published two volumes with uh, royuti shimada it's called connecting uh, the indian ocean world across sea and land and the other one merchants and ports in the indian ocean world across sea and land which was published most recently in 2023 with all due respect may i request all of you to please join me in welcoming professor radhika session the distinguished dignitaries on the dais the honorable vice chancellor professor said anul hasan professor azizuddin hussain professor arjun rao shri virender dr danish moin who i must say i remember because he did his phd in my department and i was there for his viva <laughs> the executive committee of the telangana history congress members of the congress ladies and gentlemen i would like to place on record my sincere gratitude for and appreciation of the honor that you have conferred on me for believing that my years of research on particularly maritime aspects of deccan history are of value as always and with something that i've been done doing off and on i will be talking of the deccan in history and i have titled it the deccan in history perspectives and prospects let me start with perspectives uh, i promise you i will not read out the whole long thing i will be reading bits and pieces of it what does one understand by the word deccan there have been many answers given to this question for residents of the city of pune the city to which i belong the answer is very simple it refers to one specific area of the city 
Some would maybe go on a little and mention Deccan College, but the association is still with the city. This kind of understanding is not typical of Pune, for similar locations of identity and attachment would be found in any city. These may not be specific to a particular part of the city, as with Pune, but to the ambience or the culture. Hyderabad, in popular imagination, is often linked to the very distinctive Hyderabadi Hindi and, of course, biryani. Parallels exist for every historic or not-so-historic cities as well, irrespective of which part of the world in the city may be located. For example, and to take this a little further, for many in Tamil Nadu and Kerala, there is no Deccan, there is only the north, and the north stretches north of Tamil Nadu. I have had people uh, sympathize with me for living in North India, and I never considered Pune North India. But I have people from, the, from Tamil Nadu sympathizing with me, saying, poor you having to live in North India. I don't know, know if that is still the case, but many years ago, in North India, there was no Deccan. There were only madrasis, as a generic term. However, these aspects apart, the term is usually understood to be a geographical region, and therefore, the Deccan. Then, if one were talking to an archaeologist, the identification would move beyond the, this geography to the archaeological findings of the Deccan region. It is an unfortunate reality, though, that most of the people I have spoken to are unaware of where exactly in the Deccan these sites are located, far less the time frame of these sites. The Chalcolithic period of India's past was first identified with the excavations at Jorve in the 1950s, and as pointed out, they represent a cult cultural continuum across the region of Southeast Ma Rajasthan, Madhya Pradesh, and Maharashtra, extending to the Godavari River in North Karnad Karnataka. Other historians, depending on period of interest and research, would talk of the 16th of the 16 Mahajanapadas being located in the Deccan, or of the Satvahans, or a little later, to the expeditions of Alaudan Khalji to the Deccan, to, as Professor Hussain has just said, Mohammed Tukluk and the transfer of the capital to Daltabad, and then move straight on to the Marathas, with perhaps a few detours via Bijapur and Golconda. Those who specialize in Maratha history would then go into details and link this history both to the region and to the broader continuities and changes in the period. But the point of reference is often Maratha history. Moving further south, particularly Karnataka, the concern is with the Vijayanagar legacy, sometimes also including Hyder Ali and Tipu Sultan. The general term is that, the general understanding that for the Marathas and the Mughals is the contemporary is only Dakhani Sultanates. But many are still unaware of how many Sultanates there were and how long they lasted. What I'm trying to say is the Deccan, as both idea and region, is often and even now very nebulous. Is the Deccan to be identified in geographical terms as the plateau area south of the Vindhyas, including primarily the modern-day states of Maharashtra, North Karnataka, parts of Andhra Pradesh, and Telangana? Or does it include the entire peninsula of India, thus evoking the general idea of Dakshina? Does it consist of the three parts of the coastal strip, termed Konkan, Kanara, and if you move, then called the Jinji Coast, the Jinjeli Coast? There's a whole lot of terms. Or is it the Ghats? Is it the plateau region beyond the Ghats? Or is it across to the larger eastern coastal plain? Or to ask the diff question differently, is the Deccan only the northwestern part of the peninsula, or does it cover a larger region? Farishta in the 17th century said that Hind had three sons, Tilang, Marhat, and Kanhar. This seems to be the plateau alone, without taking in any of the other parts of the peninsula. In early Indian texts, the subcontinent was divided into five major regions, of which one was Dakshinapatha. Then, south of Dakshinapatha, which was Tungabhadra and the Krishna rivers, was Dravidadesha or Tamilaha. Deccan then began 
pretty early to be distinguished from South India, which is then taken to refer to the area from the Krishna till the tip of the peninsula. An addition to this has been trying to trace the expansion of North Indian elements into South India, seen either as the spread of the Sanskritic culture or its corollary, the subjugation of Dravidian to Aryan. All these words in quotes. The Deccan then becomes an add-on, in a sense, to these two distinct regions, which is then denied a specificity of its own and which only draws in both. So the Deccan, in this understanding, is unique only in that it offers a perfect or not so perfect synthesis of both the other areas. Can this be justified? Kay and Shastri argued against the limitation of South India to only Tamilaham, and Ganpati Subaya has asked why there should be a South at all in Indian history. By the same logic, can one really argue that the Deccan is unique only because it represents the ultimate example of synthesis in India's culture, and so is the quintessential mosaic of Indian culture? What if the Deccan, its history and its culture, in itself? These are questions to which I don't have any answers. In good academic fashion, I will say, as Dr. Rao has just said, more research is required. However, I will go now into the historiography. There has been generally a tendency to view the history of the world in the post-Renaissance period from a totally European perspective. Studies have concentrated on the development of European commerce and the corresponding maritime impact. And please forgive me, I will be talking a lot of the maritime world. That is my major area. It was said in 1902 that the greatest event since the creation of the world, apart from the incarnation and death of him who created it, has been the discovery of the Indies. And the reference was to America, not to India. Implicit in this and in similar statements, is the Eurocentric mode of thought. Such an approach fails to take into account the process by which the European domination over Asia and Africa was achieved, and more importantly, tends to negate the economic and political vibrancy of non-European powers in the pre-18th century world. However, this is a development post-colonialism. We are all familiar with Pliny the Elder's complaint about the drain of Rome's wealth on luxuries from India. Researchers have proved over and over again that the Indian Ocean network was home to perhaps among the oldest and the most sophisticated commercial and maritime activities of the world. Let me move on to specifics. And as I said, I will talk more of maritime and then come to the general ones. Trade and maritime history have, over the past few decades, developed a little in terms of research. Among others, the works of Ashindas Gupta, Sanjay Subramaniam, S. Arasratnam, Sushil Chaudhary, K.S. Matthew, and Pius Malikandatil has, have focused on Bengal, Gujarat, Kerala, and the Coromandel regions. And the emphasis has been, by and large, on the changes that resulted in the Asian trading world after the entry of the Europeans. There is still, however, very little done on the internal linkages of the merchants and of these trade networks. Once again, Deccan suffers because the linkages in, across, and through the Deccan are not studied. The blanket statements of such historiography are extremely problematic. Unfortunately, and as Professor Hussein said, much of the extant research on the Deccan has focused on the socioeconomic aspects and much more on the social rather than the economic aspects. They have also tended to be very, very dynasty oriented. This is particularly well represented in, for example, the works of H.K. Shirwani or G.H. Yazdani. They have focused on the Bahamani, Adil Shahi, and the Qutub Shahis in particular, but have tended to ignore the other Dakhani Sultanates. There is one extensive work on the Sultanate of Ahmadnagar, that of Radhisham, but none on Bidar and Berar. There is a considerable body of research on Maratha history, including that of the late A.R. Kulkarni and many others, but this research is concerned primarily with the 17th century and later, and tends to view the earlier dynasties, particularly Bahamani and Adil Shah, as the backdrop against which 
to study Maratha history. Then, for the study of the early Deccan, again, Yazdani's work is of considerable importance. In more recent years, Himanshu Prabha Rai has concentrated on aspects of economic history of the Satvahans, with particular reference to the nature of land grants and to maritime history. Ranabir Chakravarti has done a phenomenal amount of work on the economic history of the early medieval age, especially the trade uh, networks of the region. Then there are monographs on specific cities, but these are essentially studies of architecture. Such works range from Nawab Framur's Jang Bahadur's A Guide to Beder with Historical Notes, published in 1894, to George Michel and Mark Zabrowski's Architecture and Art of the Deccani Sultanates, published as part of the New Cambridge History of India series in 2008. In between are a whole range of others. J.D.B. Gribble's History of the Deccan, first published in 1896, and something that I came across very, very recently, Anirudh Kaniseti, Lords of the Deccan, Southern India, from the Chalukyas to the Chulas. This was published in 2022. Now let me go back to the beginning and ask the question with which I began, but with a slight twist. What constituted the Deccan, the region or its people? Was there just something distinctive about both? In the 17th century, the Deccan was seen by foreign travelers as a very distinct political unit. So we have the account of the French traveler, Thévenot, who said that, quote, Deccan was heretofore a most powerful kingdom. It consisted of all the countries that are in that great tongue of land, which is betwixt the gulfs of Cambay and Bengal, and, Bagla, and Bengala, all obeyed the same king, nay, the provinces of Balagat, Telanga, and Baglana, which are towards the north, were comprehended within it. It was divided, I'll skip a bit, that kingdom in process of time had been often dismembered. He went on to say that the most powerful of the kings of the Deccan, next to Bijapur, Bijapur is the king of Golconda. His kingdom borders on the east side upon the Sea of Bengal, to the north upon the mountains of the country of Orissa, to the south upon many countries of Bisnagar, Vijayanagar, or ancient Narsing, which belonged to the king of Bijapur. And it carries on. But there is one interesting part where he says that there is the region of Balagat, which is the last place of Mughalistan on this side. Mughalistan is the term that they used for the Mughal Empire. 17th century, middle of the 17th century, the French traveler, Abbe Carey, had a slightly extended argument where he says, the name Deccan implies a southern country, and this the author of the Periple notes, who says expressly, that from Barigaza, the country which lies to the southward, from that is, on that account called Dakhinabadis. The Indian signifying the south side by the term Dakhan. And this distinction, I find confirmed by this names having the same purport in other parts of India. So here's another geographical description. The Deccan refers to the area south of Bharuj, Barigaza, and this delineation was both geographic and historically determined. Clear from this is the understanding of the old idea of the Deccan, of the coast, the ghats, the plateau, but excluding the far south, as well as the areas included in Gujarat. The Deccan here is a political unit defined by geography, but much more obviously by political domination. But we need to go beyond all of this. These descriptions leave us no room for communities. It does not take note of cultural diversities, of language, ritual, community, inter or intra-community practices, the networks of cultural, linguistic, and relig religious and regional linkages. Who were the locals? Who were the foreigners? Were they identified in terms of community, religion, ethnicity, or sphere of action? What role did the state play in granting them status or underscoring their claims to legitimacy and identity? Were there conflicts among the different communities or groups? And were these conflicts over actual control of resources 
or they, were they more geared towards power and ideology, or was it a mixture of all of these? The period from about 600 till about 1300 AD is often seen as one of great importance in the history of India. Studies on this period have highlighted issues of feudalism and regionalism or dynastic histories. For the Deccan, these last have sometimes, and actually in my opinion fairly limitedly, focused on the Rashtrakuta, Chalukya, Yadava dynasties. Given the fact that regional level political formations existed and were being more ma made more explicit, it would be logical to argue, among other things, that urban settlements developed during the period and were one reflection of economic growth. Epigraphic evidence points to the emergence of three types of exchange centers called Mandapika, Petha or Pentha, and Nagara. The first reference to a Petha as an administrative unit comes from the seventh century in an inscription from the Satara district of Maharashtra. A text of the 10th century describes in great detail the attributes of a large peta, and in accordance with the earlier Buddhist terminology, calls such a term a puta bhedana, a big commercial center. Such centers are further designated as shulkasthana, centers which degenerated tolls and customs. Inscriptions of the Kakatiyas of Varangal talk of adda, santhe, and penta. The first is possibly a derivation from the Sanskrit hat, meaning a, lo meaning a local guard market. The second seems to be derived from the Tamil sande, meaning a local market again. The last seems to be the local variant of petha. What is clear from the inscriptions is that the, there is a clear distinction being made between village level markets and fairs and of larger markets. Here is an economic dimension linked to urbanization, linked to trade, linked to the establishment of multiple networks of communication and trade, which have never been studied extensively. Ports, unfortunately, are missing in these accounts. Kalyan, Nala, Sopara, all today's suburbs of Mumbai, were important in both coastal and long distance trade, and I mentioned the peripolis of the Eritrean Sea. Arab geographers of the 10th century Al-Masudi in particular, gave a great many details about the ports like Chaul. Then we have uh, the Geniza documents, which talk about the connections with Mangalore and Al known in those documents as Al-Manjarur. There is a lot. Similar documentation does not really exist for the East Coast. So yes, it exists, but we have very, very stray references. Inland towns, small, medium, big, are not studies. Studies of Belur, Halibidu, even Bijapur and Golconda have been from the perspective of political history and architecture. But what of layout, water management, markets, supplies, and markets for the specific supply of luxury goods? Sanjay Subodh has done some marvelous work on the water systems of Golconda and Bidar, but what of other cities? The Deccan, in geographic terms, is an area of both immense water and immense water shortages, both of which make the management of this resource something of crucial importance. They have not been studied. The modern state of Telangana does not have a coastal district. But as we all know, even if we talk only of Hyderabad, we are talking of multiple networks of trade and wealth. There are a few studied of Hyderabad, but what of Warangal? Mentioned as being one of the strongest forts of the medieval age, of Alampur and its mud forts, of Nizamabad, and many more. And so I will move to the second part of my talk, which is on prospects. What directions of research can be identified to take the study of the Deccan further? There are any number of areas which, I have, which have not yet been touched upon. I will identify a few only, which uh, I will also say is entirely based on my own personal biases and what I feel needs to be worked on. Now, the uh, Bahmani Sultanate many ways laid out the broad framework of the operation of subsequent systems in medieval Deccan. It has been stated by the historian H.K. Sherwani in particular that the Tokhlak entry changed the dynamics of the Deccan. 
To some extent, this is true. But it should not be forgotten that once the Amirs had rebelled and had chosen one of their, member, near their number, Ismail Mulk, as an independent king of the Deccan, the shape of the Sultanate began to be steadily altered to diverge considerably from systems in the north. At the time of the establishment of the kingdom, there were three main power bases that had to be taken into account, for all were, in different ways, seeking benefit from the upheavals of the Deccan. The first group consisted of the nobles who were interested in setting up an independent Deccan-based kingdom, and one in which their roles would be far greater than had been the case until then. The second group consisted of those still loyal to the Tughlaq dynasty, and the third, the local elite. Here, then, is our first area of research, that of social change and mobility. The dakhni afaki divide is something that has been talked about, but what of local and village elite? Can we now look to identify new social formation, perhaps the emergence of new communities? Philip Calkins has, in a different context, talked of the emergence of a regionally oriented elite. And that, I think, is a good concept to be used for studying the Deccan. Something that needs to be remembered, and this is a slight digression, is that gunpowder had made its entrance into the India via the Deccan as early as the middle of the 14th century. Mention is specifically made of the Franks and Turks who were in charge of cannon, and we should further note that one of the largest cannon ever made in India, known as the Malika al Medan, was cast in the Deccan. I'll come back to this point later. In recent times, the history of great men has deservedly been given up. However, in the context of the Deccan, there are a few personages who have not really been discussed in any detail, and certainly not in the broader context of the region as a whole. Mahmud Gama, Malik Ayaz, Malik Ambar, and Mir Jumla were all important nobles, traders, and military leaders, but they have often been studied only through a single lens. So Mahmud Gama as the minister of the Bahmanis, Malik Ambar as someone who re reorganized the revenue structure of the Deccan, and Mir Jumla as the prime minister of Golconda. But Mahmud Gama was an erudite man whose letters give us immense information both about epistolary styles of the time and of the connected worlds of Asia. An able administrator and military strategist, he was also a former slave and as an example of the long established maritime connections between India and Abyssinia. Malik Ayaz is mentioned by the Portuguese writer Duarte Barbosa as the governor of Diu, an old man, very good rider, judicious, industrious, and learned. He possesses a very strong artillery which is renewed from day to day. He also has many rowing galleys, well-designed and equipped, the last of particular importance given the commonly accepted notions that Indian states were unconcerned with the sea. Malik Ambar and Chand Bibi are names well known in connection with the defense of the Sultanate of Ahmednagar and for Malik Ambar in a very effective campaign against the Mughals. And Mir Jumla gives us yet another example of a foreign noble who made his life and career in India. From coming with the caravan of a horse trader to rising to the prime minister of the Golconda kingdom and feared by the Europeans on the coast to his final move to join Aurangzeb at his death in the Assam campaign, he dominated the scene for almost half a century. Should we not contextualize these figures and many others who are great, of great importance to smaller regions within the Deccan? Polity and person personages are one part of the history. A very visible part is the monumental architecture, which both continued the legacy of earlier rulers, rulers and added new dimensions. Eaton and Wagoner have pointed to the ways in which earlier structures were taken apart, shifted, and set up again in a new location. An example is the step well at Hampi, which was an older Chalukya well. There is a claim to legitimacy made in the movement and the re-establishment of the Chalukya well in exactly the same form. Legitimacy was asserted through such efforts, as well as things like the creation of gardens. As in Ahmednagar, the garden outside the fort was both an assertion of power and the deliberate use of space to identify the key geographical location to this rise to power. Water management, to come back to that, was obviously of tremendous importance. So we have the Taj and the Chand Baudis in 
uh, Bijapur, the Khanat that supplies water to Bidar Fort, the ingenious system by which water, water was bought, brought from probably the Durgam Cheruvu in Hyderabad to Golconda Fort, and of course the step wheels. The recent work by Daud Ali and Emma Flat, which in the introduction talks about the links between Ahmed, that's Ahmed Nizam al Mulk, the founder of the Nizam Shahi dynasty of Ahmednagar, Ahmed's new garden, and the emerging independent sultanate of Ahmednagar are hardly coincidental. There is a very conscious use of space. There is a very a conscious use of designation of space to assert power and identity. I will not touch on the Bhakti and the Sufi movements. I will not talk about it in the presence of an expert such as Professor Hussein. But I would draw attention to the need to study them from different perspectives. Again, identity, location, and acculturation. All of these are parts of the Bhakti and the Sufi networks which have not yet been looked upon. I would also add the need to study them from a totally literary perspective. What kind of language emerges through these texts and what is the range of uh, connection between that language and the language that we continue to use today? There is another dimension to which I would draw, like to draw attention, that of the development of crafts and the importance of crafts in the economy of the region. Linked to this is the importance of science and technology. Colonialism, with its emphasis on scientific inquiry, often negated the role of science as practiced in communities to dismiss it as traditional. But there is a need to study the role of practical science and technology and its place in community practices over time. My examples will be mainly drawn from weaving, but I would like to emphasize that such an approach can be utilized for any of the many crafts of pre-colonial India. Weaving and cotton are central to India. So we move from the peasant who cultivates the cotton to the ginning of the harvested cotton, to the spinning of the yarn, to the weaving of the cloth, to the dyeing of the cloth, and finally to the sale of the cloth. Such a description hides more than it explains. For cultivation, where do the plows and oxen come from? Were there local markets for the, purchases, for the purchase and sale of cattle, including oxen? Was there a specific area from which the wood came for specific purposes? Wood is required for the plow, of course, but also for the spinning wheel and for the loom. And weaving communities presently in Tamil Nadu are very clear that the same type of wood should not be used for different purposes. Telangana and Karnataka, with their forest wealth, would have been the logical sources for the supply of wood. But that leads us to another question, of which merchants were involved in this trade? Drawing on my own research for the area further south, we have there a mention of a category of merchants who are termed Silai Settis, who were merchants who traded only in a very specific variety of cloth. cloth. Can we look for such evidence of such specialized group for different materials in the Deccan as well. Moving on to the loom, there were three different kinds of looms that were used in the Deccan region. The standing loom, the pit loom, and the treadle loom. Most often in the Deccan, we find mention of pit looms in which a pit was dug, the loom made across it, and the weaver sat with his legs inside the pit to do the weaving. Pits had to be made with bricks or stone, had to be smoothened, and had to be covered with lime. And so we have three other crafts coming into, the, into play here, of brick making, of stone cutting, of limestone quarrying and lime pits to make the lime to be used as a cover. Why have we not looked for traces of such occupations? Dyeing is yet another occupation, but the making of a dye requires knowledge of minerals and metallurgy, as well as the cultivation of the plants from which the dye is made. We all know of indigo, and European records talk of indigo being produced near Machlipatnam and sold in that port. Similar statements occur with reference to the madder plant and red dye, and both are to be found all over the peninsula. And finally, we go to markets and merchants for both inland and overseas trade. To be remembered is that for both, trans transportation facilities are required in the form of carts, back oxen, back mules, 
head loads or shoulder loads for smaller distances, river craft, ferries, and large sailing ships. For all these, we are back to craftspeople and to the location of these crafts. Let me come back to gunpowder. As I said earlier, the Malikai Maidan, regarded as the heaviest gun to be made, is in Bijapur. But where was it made? Where exactly was it cast? Which community made it? Where did all the metals required for its manufacture come from? Vijay Ramswami has drawn attention to the history of metalworking in Tamil Nadu. Given the antiquity of ironworking in, Andhra Pradesh, in the Andhra Pradesh region in particular, as testified through the many archaeological traces, such a study could well be undertaken for this region as well. And what of saltpeter for the manufacture of gunpowder? When did this technology and knowledge enter the Deccan? And on a totally very tangential and a random note, what of the lakh bangles for which Hyderabad used to be famous? The area is still called Chudi Bazaar, but the Chudis today are of plastic or of glass and not wood or lakh. What has happened to them? And yet another craft that I, need, that I think needs much more research is that of writing with its allies of painting and calligraphy. In Delhi, till well into the 20th century, there were masters of calligraphy who lived in one part of the old city and who both practiced and taught their craft. There are two questions that I think need to be looked at for the Deccan of whether there were similar areas that were identified by this activity and what effect this kind of demarcation of craft and space had on the urban structures of the time. As I said earlier, Telangana had considerable environmental diversity. How did communities in the past deal with this? Here, the role of various state systems and the kind of revenue that they acquired from these areas is of tremendous importance, for revenue records give us a great deal of both direct and indirect information about the systems that existed in the past. What was taxed, how much was collected, the process of collection, all provide indications of multiple levels of society and polity and the interaction between the two. Again, as an example, I'll go back to my own research where I had inscriptions of the Chola period talking of remitting the tax on one loom because that master weaver had 10 looms and 10 weavers working for him. Is this not entrepreneurship? I will provide just a few examples, all from inscriptions, of the kind of research that is possible. And this is, I will also say, based on my current project on the weaving communities of South India. And I hope that those who are here will take up some of these aspects in earnest. One inscription from Tripurantakam talks of the grant of a garden in the village Jellipalli, exempting it from the payment of taxes. I would like to link this mention of gardens with my earlier discussion on Daud Ali and Emma Flatt's book. At the very least, there are two indicators here. One is of the existence of gardens, and the second of such areas being taxed. Another inscription talks about the Dharma Chaliya Janulu, weavers who possibly along with the merchants, granted one vishamu for every gadhyana earned from the sale of cloth. So one gold coin being granted from the sale of cloth. And by the time we come to the Vijayanagar inscriptions, we get mention of paraya looms. There are other sources that can be tapped and studied in different ways to get a greater sense of the times and the spaces of concern to individual research. Thank you. Professor Bhangya Bhukia's work on the history of the Gorns and on the Lambadas are a case in point. We know that in medieval times, the Banjara community was both extensive and greatly involved in the internal trade, but hardly any work has been done on this community. And what of the Armenians? Hyderabad has an Armenian cemetery, which is today in very bad shape. But we know from the account of the Tamil merchant Anandaranga Pillai that news of Nadir Shah's invasion of Delhi was given to a Nizam by an Armenian merchant, together with the information that the Nizam's son was one of those involved in inviting Nadir Shah to India. Yet another area of potential research is that of the question of transition. Rajan Gurukul and Malini Adiga have studied the process of transition in early and early medieval South India in considerable detail. But what of the transition to the medieval itself? 
I am not arguing for the application of the feudalism theory or the segmentary state model or any other model for that matter, but processes of transition and then of identity formation, structures of assertion of legitimacy, which need to be understood for the Deccan in greater depth. And finally, I will come back to maritime trade and to its relevance. We all know that the Deccan is bounded on two sides by the sea, and there are ports all along our coastline. Routes crisscross the Deccan, used by merchants, pilgrims, mendicants, soldiers, adventurers, and a host of others. I have studied some of these routes and have tried to map them, but as always, much remains to be done. In the late 8th, 17th century, the Italian adventurer made Niccolo Manucci made mention of some of the routes. So did the Abbe Carey. He gave us a detailed description of the route that he followed from, to get from Bijapur to Golconda. Tavernia again has accounts. All of these need to be mapped in greater detail. And so finally, I would argue that what we need in Deccan is a multidisciplinary approach which puts together cartography, sociology, economics, and uses all of these to build a better understanding of the Deccan, the region, and its economy. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much uh, for provoking some question that we need to be very attentive to in our research. Um, on this occasion, we have some books to be released uh, by the Honorable Vice Chancellor, Professor Sayyid Anwar Hassan Sahab. Uh, may I request the volunteers to please get the books on the stage? The first to be released uh, is the Telangana History Congress proceeding, the last year's proceeding. Okay, we'll let the Vice Chancellor Saab to make his points and for his remarks. And after that, we'll continue with the uh, book release. Professor Sayyid Anwar Hassan Saab. In the name of the one who created life and wisdom, Professor Radhika Sishan, Professor Azizuddin Hussain, Professor Arjun Rao, and Mr. Virendra, Professor Danish Moeen, host of dignitaries, participants, paper presenters, girls and boys. Now, after listening to the extensive talks about the region, one can conclude that the dominant historians neglected glorious past of the region. It is somehow, but today I am glad that historians and scholars are putting their heads together to rediscover the Deccan. And this is a hellenious task. You must correct the line of action. Well, I, being a student of Persian language and literature, my intervention in history, I don't know to what extent it is conducive for the health of history. <laughs> Professor Deepak Kumar is sitting here. He is smiling, you see. But yes, you know, history is related to everyone. But at times, there are certain contentious issues also. Well, time and again, we raise these issues. On one hand, literature, on the other hand, history. Aristotle says that discussion about the past is history. Deliberation about the present is poetry in his in his boutique, you know, poetica. Well, so I will confine myself to poetry only. Because I don't have, you know, jurisdiction to cross my boundaries. But you know, at times, uh, well, there are certain, as I said, uh, this, uh, the bone of contention is whether capital was shifted to Devgiri or not. Well, we have no, our interest is, 
very meager story, whether shifted or not, what the historian says. But we are trying to beautilize in the eyes of beholder, you see. We see how many poets were there. As you know, Shibli Nomani discovered there were about, you know, 350 odd poets at the court of Akbar, Jalaluddin Muhammad Akbar. Now historians are not telling us. He was a man of literature. So what happens is all out of 350, Khane Khanan was also one of them, who wrote Zakhiratul Khawaneen. And what Khane Khanan wrote, if historians will see, one more interpretation will come to the mind. But a, little, a person who belongs to literature will see through a different eye. Shahi ke bugzara daz no se peher af sareu, egar gholame alini is khak bar sareu, mahabbate shahe marjan, shahe mardan, majuz e bipe dari, sajatab ke daste ghair giraftas pae madareu. Now, who is Ali here? The historians will discover. A king who surpasses nine spheres, and even after that, not in service of Ali. That means, this is literature, that means his existence is illegitimate as his mother's. Now this is an abuse. We make, literature makes frowning faces. Historians are glad that, look, there is Ali who was abused very badly by Khane Khanan. See, I'm telling you, this is how, you know, we have contention. contention. Your interpretation, my interpretation. Okay? If history is not supporting you, literature will support you. Wali Dakkani was first Urdu poet, nobody can deny. Even Mir has mentioned in his poetry that I have learned from a Wali. Now be happy. Put your heads together and say yes. Someone says that there was a Mushaira. And then out of the Mushara auditorium, some people were taking tea. And in the meantime, a person intervenes and says that, look, you know, this Urdu was, Urdu ki padaish yain shuvi thi. Another one intervened and said, پیدہ نہیں اردو کی پیدائش یہیں چھوئی تھی نہیں لیکن اردو کا انتقال پرملال یہیں ہوا تھا ڈیفرنٹ انٹرپیٹیشن بھائی this is a matter of interpretation how do you interpret how do you perceive so I don't know what historians are doing I am a student of literature so therefore you see out of box I can't speak you know let me tell you how differently we think and we perceive. And, you know, whatever you perceive, this is also to be appreciated. What we perceive, you also admire. Okay, this is your perception. Pas kya hai shikasta hali mein? Suni Kazmi sahab, literature ke admi aap. Pas kya hai shikasta hali mein? Kush lakheere hai daste khali mein? Now how historians will see? will start translating. Oh, poor man had nothing at his disposal. See, this is, this is your history. Poor man had nothing at his disposal except for a few fate lines. No, literature will not translate that. What I have to offer to my beloved? Kajmi sahab, begay beloved ke ab zinda nahi reh sakte dar. What I have, I have to offer to my beloved. 
is my entire destiny is at her disposal now this is interpretation a person belonging to literature will interpret like this mirza ghali will come out with say yan thi hamari qismat ke wa sale yaar hota agar aur jeete rehte yahi intezar hota now beauty lies in the eyes of beholder how do you perceive things everything is at your disposal so anyway i am glad that you have started a discussion and i know you are capable historians i wish all the best to you thank you very much thank you sir i request the volunteers to please get the book uh, the proceedings of the telangana history congress it is a collection of all the papers presented in the last telangana history congress that was held as nizamabad the second book um is actually urdu translation of professor deepak kumar's very famous book atam khabar and that urdu translation is done by dr kahkasha latif i request both of you to please come on the dais assalamu alaikum bismillahir rahmanir rahim ye kitab professor deepak kumar sahab ki tehreer karda hindustani tehzeeb samaj aur siyasat ka batadreej irtaqa hai और इसमें ये ख्याल पेश किया गया है कि यहाँ पर वर्ण व्यवस्था जात पात का निज़ाम किस तरह शुरू हुआ तहजीब किस तरह डेवलप हुई किस तरह बतदरीज इरतका कौमों का हुआ और हमारे यहाँ अतिदि सर्वे भवंतु सुखना संतु सर्वे संतु निरामया का जो कंसेप्ट था उस तरह उसको किस तरह से डेवलप किया गया और बाद में सियासत किस तरह से बदल बतरी बतदरीज बदलती रही उसका भी तस्वुर स्ट्रेट फॉरवर्ड अंदाज में बरह रास्त दीपक कुमार साहब की किताब में मौजूद है और एक बात बहुत अहम है कि बहुत दिलचस्प अंदाज में इन्होंने तहजीबी मुहावरे तहजीबी पस अल्फाज लोकल अल्फाज और अवामी ज़बान में इसको पेश किया है ये बहुत दिलचस्प किताब है और कारी को कभी अपने एतम हमेशा कारी को अपने एतम में ले लेती है बहुत बहुत शुक्रिया दीपक कुमार साहब कि आपने ये शहादत दी सारी मेहनत की है हम बहुत शुक्रगुजार हैं हमारे सभी दोस्त जो डायस पे हैं और सुन रहे हैं आ, मुझे बड़ी खुशी हुई कि आ, मौलाना आज़ाद नेशनल उर्दू यूनिवर्सिटी में मुझे वक्त गुजारने का मौका दिया गया है मिल रहा है उसी का नतीजा ये हुआ कि जो कुछ मैंने इस दौरान थोड़ा अपनी ज़ुबान में हिंदुस्तानी ज़बान में लिखने की कोशिश की देवनागरी स्क्रिप्ट में उसको हमारी दोस्त कहकशा मैम ने तर्जुमा करके आपके सामने रखा है और मुझे लगता है कि शायद आपको ज़रूर ज़रूर पसंद आएगा इसमें मैंने कोशिश खाली ये कि नाम आतम खबर है वो मैंने कबीर से लिया अब आतम किसको कहते हैं ये तो कबीर साहब बेहतर जानते थे मैंने कोशिश किया है कि वो आप देखें और ख़बर जो है हिस्टोरियन का काम तो खबर लेना है खबर देना है खबरिया तो है ही हिस्टोरियन इसमें कोई शक नहीं तो कुछ उसी तरह से वैसे मैंने कोशिश की खबर देने की ज़्यादा खबर ली कम है <laughs> थोड़ा को रेस्ट्रेन रहा मैं और डेढ़ सौ सफ़े में हमने तकरीबन दो हज़ार साल की बात कोशिश की है कम से कम आपके पास रखने की तो आप उम्मीद है कि आपको मज़ा आया होगा हम बहुत शुक्रगुजार हैं दोबारा कहूँगा कि ये तो सारा सारी मेहनत 
कहकशा मैम की है और हमारी हिस्ट्री डिपार्टमेंट ने हिस्ट्री मौलाना आज़ाद यूनिवर्सिटी ने बहुत ही हौसला अफजाई की है हमारी मुझे यहाँ कर के बहुत खुशी होती है मैं तो जन्नत में हूँ ऑलरेडी और 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 इससे आगे जाने की खुश की कोई कोई ख्वाहिश नहीं है थैंक यू वेरी मच बहुत शुक्रिया आपका वी हैव वन अदर बुक दिस इज कॉल्ड तेलंगाना लैंड एंड पीपल विच इज़ एक्चुअली फाइव वॉल्यूम सीरीज Uh, out of which three volumes have been published, and uh, this series uh, has been prepared and edited by Professors Rekha Pandey and Dr. A. J. A. K. Goel and their colleagues. Um, I would request the volunteers to get the book and request Professor Rekha Pandey uh, and Dr. A. K. Goel, if he is here, to please come on the dais. vice chancellor sir and all the dignitaries on the dais i would really like to thank uh, molana azad uh, urdu university for giving this opportunity we have been teaching at the mari chinna reddy institute for the last uh, 15 20 years you know i take courses on gender and history these are ias and other officers who get uh, selected and they come for orientation and courses etc and uh, uh, mr goel though he is a uh, Uh, technologist he's passed from uh, iit he has been an administrative um, uh, service officer but his passion for history is something which you can only talk to him and understand and he did lot of uh, uh, lessons with them on technology and then when telangana was formed we thought that you know many colleges had introduced um, this thing on telangana history there are a lot of courses which are being taught and we didn't find any book which really covered everything so we got together uh, zarina par madam could not come she is the director of archives madhuri four of us together so we wrote down we planned five volumes we thought we will release four the fourth is still in the press it has not come out but finally we plan to bring out five five volumes will come out the good news is since this is a project of the telangana government and mchrd the chinnaredi institute it is available free of cost on software so those of you can go to the net at mc chinnaredi institute you can really download all the volumes and even the other volume they have not put i think it cost 300 500 because the whole purpose was that we wanted more reach more and more people to use it so you can even download it freely and i hope you will cover because we have covered right from the beginning different aspects society economy technology women all these aspects have been covered thank you very much honorable vice chancellor sir adab i am a lover of telangana that's all is my introduction we will have tea time we'll have plenty of discussions i am waiting here i am staying over here but about this book let me say something each chapter of this book has been perused by the ias officers ips officers who come for training in lbs academy masuri and marri chenna reddy academy in hyderabad this is not a book written by me it's a book which has evolved in a classroom over two years each volume we write something we circulate among them they read it they correct it they give it to us again we make a final copy and then the final copy is given to a band of professors who know the subject women studies we have professor ekha pandey archaeology we have a practicing archaeologist dr sachin arayana 
Then we have archives. The director herself, Zarina, I wish she was here. One more name, Dr. Madhvi. She is a professor of jurisprudence in the Murray Channel Institute. Of course, I am myself a science and technology student from IIT Kanpur in 71. And administration has become a part of my life through the service of IAS in Andhra Pradesh cadre right from 74 to 2010. That's all right. I mean, that's not important. But this is a book of a classroom product. First volume, Stone Age, we talked till 1323. Some date, you have to limit it. We talk of Stone Age, we talk of the Mesolithic, we talk of Neolithic, we talk of the 16 Mahajanpadas, we talk of Buddha, the Mauryas, the Ashoka, the Shatvahanas, the Vakataks, the Rashtrakuts, the Chalukyas, and Kakithyas. That's the first volume, that's it. Of course, we talk of per capita income, we talk of population, we talk of mode of production, we talk of agriculture, and we talk of the trade. Not as profound as probably the professor would like it, but still rudimentary. Second volume is from 1323 to, the date is important, 1323 to 1723, it's a very important phase. We call it medieval and all that. Somehow I'm a student of science and technology. For me, the time is okay, fine, but call it by whatever name. But this is a very, very important period in the history of this land called Telangana. We talk of Bahmanis, we talk of Qutub Shahis, we talk of Mughals, and of course, there we talk of Marathas intervention, and then of course we have the Asaf Zahis. I mean, that's a very crucial period. What is important? is not what has been written here. What is important is that in our opinion, that has not been said anywhere. We have traced the history of population from 1300 to 1700 for Telangana land. We have seen the agricultural continue. We have seen the taxation. We have seen the trade, the commerce. And then, of course, people don't really talk about it. The climatic conditions. It was a period of climatic change also. Third volume is from 1300, 1723 to 1858, to be precise. First November 9, 1858 is the third volume. And that, of course, is a period of the first phase of Asaf Zahis, the three, four Nizams. And that talks about whatever economy, technology, science, etc. This is what we have done till now. There are two more volumes. 1st November 19, 1858 till 17th September 1948 is the fourth volume, and the fifth volume would be 1948 till 2014. We are working at it. It will take time. We hope that probably by next History Congress, we'll be able to produce it. Thank you very much for the assignment. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, just one uh, small question. Volume 3, I have got some extra copies with me. We will keep it in one corner. After lunch, if you feel interested in carrying a hard copy of it, you can carry with you. All the best. Thank you. It's all free of cost. Uh, just a couple of more moments, sir. The Telangana History Congress in, on this occasion um, wants to honor two uh, people. Uh, the son of a freedom fighter and a renowned historian who uh, very actively writes in Telugu, English, and Urdu on the history of Telangana region. So um, I would request uh, the volunteers to please get the shawl and the sapling and request the Honorable Vice Chancellors to please honor these individuals. May I now invite Sri Vaddaraju Bapi Raju, son of veteran freedom fighter Sri Buddharaja Ramam and Sri Mati Vaddaraju Manikayamba, uh, whose family has sacrificed a lot in general in one way or the other for the Telangana movement and for India's independence. I now request Yadava Rao, sir, to please come on the dais. Uh, Kandakutti Yadava Rao, sir. He's a historian and he frequently writes in all three languages on the history of Telangana and Thank you very much, sir. Um, I very quickly would like to thank everybody 
uh, who was involved in this in the making of this program a great success. First of all, I would like to thank the Honorable Vice Chancellor, sir, for sparing his time and uh, chairing the session um, and for taking interest very actively since the beginning when we actually conceived the idea to organize the Congress. So thank you very much, sir. Uh, I also thank uh, the General President, Professor Radhika Session, for his delightful address and for, for provoking some critical questions. Uh, we also thank uh, the guests of honor, uh, Professor K. Arjun Rao and Professor S. M. Azizuddin Hussain Saha for gracing the occasion. Uh, uh, General Secretary uh, M. Virendra Ji and the Local Secretary, Professor Danish Moeen, uh, also deserve our thanks. Uh, I would particularly like to thank all my uh, colleagues uh, in the department, uh, particularly Professor Afullah Azmi, Sahab, uh, Dr. Pavez, Khalid, Dr. Daoud, and all the faculty members from the Social School of Social Sciences and Arts uh, who have very, very uh, passionately were involved in this project and have extended their warm uh, contributions. I would also like to thank uh, our colleagues in the DDE, particularly Dr. Mahabub Basha and his team, uh, Mir Abul Hussain, Sahab, and Muhammad Asim. Um, I would uh, uh, and I think that I would request all of you to please give a big, round, big round of applause to all the volunteers, uh, the volunteers from the Department of History. And I would also like to thank uh, the engineering section staff, uh, the IMC staff, uh, and all the non-teaching staff are um, Mr. Ghos, Mr. Razak, Mr. Shaikh, and everybody who was involved in, this, uh, in, the, in the organization of this conference. So thank you very much. Uh, with this, uh, this inaugural session comes to a conclusion. I would request all of you to please join us for a tea outside. We'll take a short break. Uh, yes, national anthem.